was no organized games or sports or anything organized. So we did our own thing. Visitation was pretty open. For example, you didn't have to be invited into somebody's home. You didn't even knock when you went there. To see the door open and six kids walk in and line up inside the door, not saying a word, just watching everybody there. And, and then eventually, one of them would open the door and they'd all march out again. Not a word spoken between them. You ask them their name, they might give it to you, and they, you may not understand it, but they'd give it to you. And that was it. So that was kind of a way of life. I had a next door neighbor, for example, and uh, fences were common in those days because you didn't fence animals in, you fenced them out. So you put up fences to keep the sheep out of your garden, for example. You put up other fences. Horses were running loose in the, uh, in the summer because they were only used in the winter. So they were running loose, so you put fences up to keep them out of your, we call it garden, it was the yard, really. And we'd hear them in the night, clop, 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 horses trotting along the road. And we'd be scared to death, our little kids. We thought they were going to break into the house. And uh, anyway, then nothing happened that way, but it went on. So it got to the point where we looked forward to seeing horses in harness. And we had a store, of course, in Southport. And so that was a major gathering point, both for shopping, Gooseberry Cove was one mile away. Butter Cove was another mile beyond that. So in those days, to walk two miles was not a big deal. So you just walked everywhere you went. And uh, I remember myself going to Gooseberry Cove to pick up the mail. And uh, that was, you just took it for granted. Around that time in my early years, the first radio appeared. And uh, strangely enough, a next door neighbor, because there was a company from St. John's called Great Eastern Oil, and, and they sold uh, batteries operated on a dry cell power pack. And, and Wilfred Avery, next door, listened to the radio quite a lot. I was interested in books and history and so on. So we have a lot of conversations. We, we talked on similar lines. You know, so I enjoyed Wilfred for many years. The job of the teacher in those days was mainly to maintain discipline in the school. Because right from the f beginning you had a book and you learned to read from that book. You learned your letters and then you learned to read. Laddie was the dog and Snow was the cat. So that was the earliest uh, creatures that you learned about. The teacher in the morning would say uh, what grade, you, what you had to do. And, and for example, grade three may have spelling. So they lined up across in front of the teacher's desk and the teacher would give words and each one, if you were at the head of the class, if you didn't spell it right, you went to the foot of the class and, and the next person would get the chance at it and if they got it right they stayed at the head of the class. So that was the, the lowest grade and then you went to where reading where you, the teacher would look over your shoulder while you read and the rest of the kids I don't remember how they dealt with these little kids doing their thing on exercises and reading and so on. But that's the way it worked. That's a school picture. That's me. Yeah. The tallest one in the book. In front of me is Julie Seward. Dick Seward's son is Joe Seward, who we're communicating with. So that's his father. And there's Alan, my best friend, who died at the age of 14. And in front of him, that's Lambert's daughter of him, Nina Lambert. And that's Will Balsam. That's Marjorie. And, that's, and this is a Lindy Lambert. So I think that's his sister and an older brother. The way the system worked, and it was kind of interesting with the name, up to grade eight was normal school. And it wasn't called normal school, it was just school, school period. Grade nine, 10, and 11 were CHE, Council of Higher Education. Grade nine, High Council of Higher Education. But that was controlled by the Department of Education of Newfoundland. So you had to write CHE exams when you got to grade nine and from then for the three years. There was a lot of kids dropped out before that. So it was a limited number, probably, uh, I think you could say in about six communities, and they were Anglican and United, was two, and Salvation Army, there were three different ones. I think they, they all came together, and Pentecostal. And the, the, the grade niners went to a central location, like this year it's gonna be 
Gooseberry Cove. So from the whole southwest arm, all the way up to Long Beach, the kids who were there came there and, and boarded there for, the, for a week to write their exams. And then, of course, grade 10 and grade 11. And it was a different place. One year it was in Southport. One year it was in Hartsey's Beach, Hartsey's. And one year it was in Hatchet Cove. You, know, you went swimming. That was the, but the only activity in the summer. And that would only be July and August. Uh, a lot of the kids had nothing to do. They had to carry wood in, carry water, because nobody had wells in their houses. We were the only place in Southport, I think, that had an indoor well. So you had to bring water. And, and everybody had a barrel, like a 30-gallon barrel, and that was the water barrel. So you brought buckets of water and dumped in the barrel and used from that the hoop, you know, because that kept the buckets away from your leg. And uh, so they walked along. Uh, everybody, there were two main brooks. One was down in front of our house. It flew in, walked, flowed in there. So everybody walked there to get the water. So that was, that was a chore that kids had to do, but that was limited because generally that went to the bigger brother or the bigger sister. So the little kids just played, yeah. they had games and invented games that... That's my Aunt Mary. That's my father's sister who uh, owned the first store. She um, had a fairly good business that my father ended up buying from her and she moved to St. John's, I believe. That's our wharf standing out there. And in behind here, you used to call it a factory because it downstairs, it was where, it was where you processed fish, split fish. There was also storage space there for salt, molasses, and one part of it was only in upstairs. There was a walkway went underneath that going out to the wharf, which is this wharf right here because that was a large large wharf the store originally was part of the house that I was born in and that was a family home it was all trading you fished you you bought the salt that you needed and the gasoline you needed and all that charged it and it was written down in a scribbler an exercise book the name and what you bought and how much it was and that was mom's job because dad couldn't write because he only had two years education or something, but he had the brain for business. So he bought the store from her, and then very soon afterwards, he built onto it, and then eventually tore that down and built a store there. Now, I'm not sure where the family, they lived in that store, and around that time, I think he probably built the house, present house, first, and then used the what later became the living room in that house as the store. So, except for the stuff that was on the wharf, uh, salt beef, salt pork, molasses, gas, anything like that. Like, I remember the start of the war. As a matter of fact, I was, quote unquote, helping my father. And I was eight years old, of course. I was helping him uh, spread fish on the, on the flake to dry because he kept his hand in some with the fishing, even though his main sense of livelihood was the business. And Jay Bavery was going by, who was right there, you, you know, the length of this building away. So Dad called out to him and said something about, Jay, if you get your gun, you can go to war now. He said, yeah, they pay $30 a month and found. That was an expression, and found meant your clothes were found and your groceries and, and your, where you lived and so on. The, uh, the Hubert Bryan, which was the schooner that I remembered being on. That one later, Dad sold that one after my uncle drowned, and he went years without one. And then he bought a, a reconditioned uh, a, a boat that was um, rebuilt already, partly, and he bought it basically to hull and had it refitted, masts put in it and sails. And it spent a lot of time tied up because for when Dad wanted to ship uh, fishery products to St. John's, they loaded it onto Sarah Francis. And he had, for a couple of years, I remembered Henry Thomas, father would know, Henry Thomas and Dick Seward with the crew, with Dad. And I was a little bit of a gopher. You know, I was just a, I don't know, I was a teenager, I guess. And the Sarah Francis got to be 
worn out. It wasn't measuring up for what Dad wanted it for. He wanted to extend the use of it because at that time the government was offering a rebate on any vessel that you built for the fishery. So that wasn't a hard commitment to make. Fish in Labrador, it was not hard to get a crew. So Dad had the Hubert, was to be the Hubert and Gordon. As a matter of fact, Mary painted the name on it. And when he went to register it, he couldn't register it. There was already a vessel named that. So she changed it to the Hubert G. Smith. And that was the Hubert G. Just went by Hubert G., everybody called it. Yeah. That's the one that I, that I spent um, two years on fishing in Labrador and carrying freight to and from St. John's. And so. Obviously, with a full load, we're about to leave Labrador to come home because the engine was running. I can see the water exhaust uh, pump. But your father was the captain? Initially. Okay. He made the first trip captain. Then he hired Eli Tucker, who was a former dragger fisherman, fished the Grand Banks in a dragger, yeah. which was a, a challenging job. And, and Eli uh, fit right in because he'd fished in Labrador with his father, yeah. who was another famous Newfoundland fisherman. And uh, so it was, he was well known as Cy Tucker. Right. First one is my mother. Anybody that's ever seen any pictures of the family would recognize her. Well, next to her, next to her is my sister, Mary. And next to her is my Aunt Sarah. And then it's her son, Lawrence. This is a, the latest store. This, this was the third store that my father had. The original one was part of the house. And then what we came to know as the new store was the one that was built after that. And then that had, was near the wharf. It had its limitations. And that's the one that, that your mother would have, Leona would have been familiar with at first because they knew that as the new store. As on the left was Aunt Julie, Aunt Julie Eddie, my aunt, so mom's sister. Mom's sister. Mom's. And on the far right is her husband, Uncle Charlie Eddie. Mom is first, and then it's um, Aunt Lydia and Uncle Alf. Uncle Alf is mom's brother. And that lady was his wife. And looking over his shoulder, and Sarah, that's my father's sister-in-law. And that's Uncle Alf again, and Mom, and my sister Mary. And this is Lou McCormick, and Marjorie's husband, Don Collins. This is the entrance to the SUF Lodge before it was completed, Society of United Fishermen. My father was the one with the hat on. He was the master of the lodge. Next to him was Edgar Smith. This is Mom with, that's Michelle, that's Sharon, and that's Mary Lou. There's Mom, and there's Lou next to her. In front of Lou is my sister Mary, and then his dad, and one on the end is brother Ken. And that's the house, of course, that I grew up in. It's not the house I was born in, but it's the one I grew up in. And up in the corner here is Elijah Lambert's house. And Elijah was a cousin, mom's cousin. Yeah, that brother Ken. Might be Clara. There's my sister Mary. The tower for our version of electricity was, the, uh, was a wind charger wired to the house. Initially, that wind charger was on the roof, and uh, there was a brake on it. It was a, like a shoe-type brake, and you pulled that brake from down on the ground, and sometimes that would stretch. In a storm or something, that wind charger would get going, and it would almost shake the house. It would scare the daylights out of us kids. Now, that's Uncle Alf and his full family. There's Grandfather Stoyles and Grandmother Stoyles next to, her, next to him. And uh, there's Uncle Alf, Aunt Lydia, and Daisy. This is Wesley, Cousin Wesley. Yeah, that's Southport in uh, early days, because that originally was the church. This was the new church. That's the United Church. That's the new church that was built. And that's the church I attended, because we didn't have to go very far to attend there. And in the background is all of the various boats. That's Press, he always had nice cars. Yeah, that's Leonie's husband. Now that's an oldie, and that's his grandmother. My mother is the apparent tall one, 
and the short one is her sister and Julie. That's an early picture that I know. Mildred Smith, Ike's wife, her father and her uncle owned that. They fished together. And this shed here was built by Silas, who had worked on the train as a brakeman during the war. After the war, he came back home, taught school, and did some fishing on the side. And this was the shed that he built. Yeah, that's Long Beach, and then there was a little a small community that was later abandoned called Island Cove. Then there was Hodges Cove, Capeland Cove, Heart's Ease, then there was Butter Cove, Gooseberry Cove, and Southport. <laughs>